Hi all and uh, welcome back to the Australian Reptile Park. Jake here with another live video and today we are here talking about amphibians. Now amphibians are found right throughout the world. Unfortunately many of them are facing um, some really hard times with something called chytrid fungus which we might touch on uh, a little bit later on. But we are really lucky here in Australia. We do have uh, frogs, a lot of them, um, about 200 or so species. But we do not have any of the other amphibians. There's also toads, Sicilians, uh, newts, there's a wide variety of amphibians. But here in Australia we do only have the true frogs. Now I've got one of them sitting on my arm here. And uh, this is a really iconic Australian frog, particularly within the Sydney region. Um, because it is a Sydney endemic species. This is known as the green and, green and golden bell frog. Uh, this particular individual has a lot more gold than green, but they are highly variable. Um, some will be almost entirely green, and then others do look uh, a little bit like this one here. A beautiful frog. Um, this is maybe not quite as large as they get. They'll get a little bit larger than this, um, but they are one of our medium-sized frogs. And like most frogs, they are spending the majority of their time around water. Now the water is of course where the life cycle of a frog begins and we're actually here in the reptile parks undercover picnic area and we're really fortunate to have uh, a mural behind me uh, and right around the undercover area that demonstrates or uh, shows you a bit about the life cycle of a frog. So we're going to head over here to the wall. Walls usually aren't the most inter interesting things in the world, but this one is uh, because it does allow me to show you a few of the different stages within the life cycle of a frog. Now, what we're looking at here is not eyeballs. Um, they are uh, frog eggs. Now, when a frog um, is ready to breed, the males, they'll begin to call, and uh, that's typically a sign that the breeding season has begun when you start to hear those male frogs calling. Now, eventually, they're going to come across um, some females, or the females will come to the boys, and then they will uh, basically mate. We call that uh, amplexus, where the male mates with the female, and then they'll begin to uh, basically form a bit of a foam uh, nest in which they lay their eggs, and it typically is on top of the water. Now, depending on the frog species, can, de can depend on how many eggs they have, um, but they can have many hundreds in some species, and sometimes thousands. Now, once you've got the eggs, they're sitting in the water, um, they will eventually turn into something that many, many people are familiar with, and that is uh, tadpoles. Now, this is what a tadpole looks like. It kind of resembles a frog, um, but they are typically very, very small, and they have this tail, and that is because they're living exclusively in the water to begin with. And uh, to start with, they will not have any legs. This one's got a tiny back leg, um, but that comes eventually. Um, once they've begun to develop a little bit, they'll pop out the back legs, and then um, eventually you end up with a frog. We're gonna go all the way down here. There's some longer back legs, and uh, then you end up with a tadpole rather, um, with its front legs and its back legs. Now it's really starting to look like a frog. All it's got that's a bit different is that tail still. And they'll hang on to that tail for a little while, but eventually it does reabsorb, it just disappears, and then that frog, uh, sorry, that tadpole will become truly amphibious and they can uh, live within the water and on land as well. And if we come over here, um, this is a really good example of what tadpoles will do um, when they're not quite at that stage to come out of the water. They typically will use their little legs um, to just hold on to some vegetation, um, hold on to some reeds or some moss beneath the water. And then that way, um, they're not swimming as much. They're more in that transitional, transitional stage where they're um, almost ready to come out onto the land. Now, this is a, a green golden bell frog, just like this one here. Um, and as you can see, this one's hanging out in the water. It's kind of sitting on a branch. But what they can do at this stage, this is a mature frog. Um, they can completely leave the water and they'll begin to sit um, up on some reeds or sometimes in the trees. So they can sort of just go between the two. But they typically do come uh, back to the water to lay their eggs and mate and breed. Now, we'll go back around this way here. Because what we've got over here is a very large replica green and golden bell frog. This one here is actually um, a, a mosaic tile bell frog that um, originally lived in the, uh, the airport in Sydney. Now, uh, of course, after the Olympics finished and um, all that kind of peak tourist period um, back in the early 2000s finished, um, they didn't really know what to do with this frog and we actually uh, took it on here at the park and uh, it now lives here in our undercover area and uh, it's a pretty spectacular thing to see when you are here nice up close and personal to it. Now I'm going to pop our bell frog back, back in there. 
You'll notice in the containers that we're keeping these frogs in, I've got a little bit of moss. Now this isn't um, your typical moss that you might see growing in the water, typically that's green. Um, this is more of a dry moss um, that we can wet down. It's called sphagnum moss. You typically find it um, in kind of boggy, swampy areas, and that just retains a little bit of moisture. It's really important for frogs that their skin stays wet um, and their skin is permeable, which means they can absorb things or chemicals, um, anything that might be in the water, through the skin. So it's really important that when, when, when we are working with frogs, um, that we are using gloves, one, we might have something on our hand that could damage them, but that we're also keeping them in an environment like this that stays uh, a little bit wet and that way they do not dry out. Because as I mentioned, most frogs, they are spending most of their time around the water. Now I'm typically, oh, sorry, I'm gonna pop my gloves off here after I get this lid off. I'll let you get in nice and close there to him while I take these off. What we're looking at here is perhaps our most successful species of frog. This is probably the frog with the largest distribution right across the country. This is the uh, very common Latoria cerulea or the green tree frog. And as I mentioned, they are found pretty well right across the country and uh, in a wide variety of habitats as well. You will find these in coastal areas and areas where there's a fair bit of water around, but this is one species that can deal um, with very, very dry conditions as well. In fact, I've seen these frogs in areas of outback Queensland, Mount Isa, um, out in those sorts of areas. They can do uh, quite well with minimal water. And uh, yeah, it's a big part of the reason why they are so successful. Now, this is more of your standard uh, frog. It's bright green, and uh, this is a, your classic example of a tree frog. Here in Australia, as I mentioned, we have a lot of frogs, and there's um, a bit of variety in them. Some of them are very, very tiny, and they'll spend most of their time down on the ground. They're moving around in the leaf litter, um, cruising around, walking around, that sort of thing. And then others, um, they're living in really sandy areas, and they actually rely on that sand in order to get through um, summer, which may be very, very warm with minimal rainfall. Um, an example of that would be uh, any of your spade foots, which typically live in Northern Australia. Um, they'll bunker down and head underground and live in that sand um, for the hottest part of the year, only emerging once the rain arrives. Now, this is of course, as I mentioned, a tree frog. And as the name suggests, they are spending the majority of their time um, in and around bushes, trees, but always uh, fairly close to water, typically. Now, I'm going to pop this guy back here, pop him in there, and uh, we do have one more thing to look at. We've seen two frogs so far, um, but now we are going to look at, unfortunately, probably our most famous amphibian in the country. It's not a frog, um, it is a toad, and it is also an introduced species. In fact, uh, probably the worst introduced species this country has ever seen. This is of course known as the uh, cane toad or marine toad. A lot of people think these are very ugly um, and they do look very, very different to most of our frogs. Um, they get very, very large for starters. A big female could get to about the size of a dinner plate. And unlike a frog, which will typically have nice smooth skin, you can see the toads have uh, these really rough, um, bumpy, almost protrusions on the skin. Um, and that's a pretty dead giveaway that this is a toad and not a frog. Now, one other thing you'll see, and this is a big part of the reason why they are so destructive in our ecosystems, is these glands behind the eye. These big bulbous patches there, that is the poison gland of the cane toad. These toads are extremely poisonous. What they hold inside that gland is their poison. It's kind of like a milky, yellowy color. And what is going to happen if anything comes along and wants to try and make a meal of this toad, it'll one, typically grab it on the head. And then what this toad will do is begin to exude that uh, poison from those glands and attempt to get it into the mouth of the potential predator. Now, it is very, very toxic um, to our Australian wildlife because they have not evolved with this species. This is an introduced species from uh, Central and South America. Now, in their native range, uh, they coexist with that wildlife and that um, ecosystem quite well because they have evolved together. But once they arrived here in Australia in the 1930s, they began to cause massive destruction in our ecosystems because, as I mentioned, um, they are incredibly toxic. They also have a very voracious appetite, so they can outcompete um, our native frog species for uh, prey, food. 
and uh, they also will pretty well eat anything they come across. So um, a really big toad could potentially feed on uh, something like a lizard, a smaller Australian frog, and even a snake. In fact, there was a fantastic photo going around just last week of quite a large cane toad feeding on a, uh, a taipan, I believe, uh, or it might have been a green tree frog even. Uh, one of those two species was feeding on that snake. So these guys will certainly eat snakes and uh, a variety of other small Australian wildlife. Now, the way that they got to the country is uh, they were brought over in order to hopefully get rid of uh, a cane beetle, which was destroying the cane crops in North Queensland. And uh, basically what happened, they brought them over thinking they were going to eat all these cane beetles and uh, get rid of the problem. But in actual fact, those beetles, they lived right at the top of the cane stalk, about three meters high. These cane toads, as you saw, they can jump, but not very high, only about uh, 20 or 30 centimeters off the ground. And uh, as a result, the two never interacted. The cane toad did not eat the cane beetle, but what they did is began to spread right throughout Northern Australia. Um, and from where they were originally introduced in Innisfail, they are now right across northern Queensland, um, down into southeast Queensland, and right across into the Kimberley in WA as well. Very unfortunate um, because it is just a case of this species being in the wrong place um, at the wrong time. It's not meant to be here, and because it is here, it gets a really bad rap, and uh, people, you know, they're all about killing cane toads because they are so destructive to our native eco ecosystems, but um, in their own right, they are amazing animals, and they're just in the wrong place. All right, now I might grab this guy back here. We'll hold him, we'll keep him out. And uh, I think we're going to answer some questions about our amphibians. Yeah. So are all amphibians venomous or poisonous? They're not. They're not. No. So most toad species like this, um, they are typically poisonous. They'll have those poison glands behind the eye. And some of our smaller ground-dwelling Australian frogs. Um, are poisonous as well. A corroboree frog, which is a very iconic endangered species, um, is an example of that. And there's many species overseas as well, which um, are poisonous. You poison dart frogs or po poison arrow frogs, uh, another very famous example. So it depends on the species, but no, they are not all poisonous, um, but quite a number are. What kind of diet do amphibians eat? Uh, for the most part, frogs and toads, they're um, primarily feeding on invertebrates. So um, if a frog like that green tree frog is hanging out um, you know, next to a beautiful stream, what they're typically gonna be feeding on is moths, uh, crickets, worms, basically anything that's living in their environment that's smaller than them, um, they will try and make a meal out of. So you went through the life cycle before. Do you want to go, because we've had new people join the stream, just a quick overview of, of the life cycle of a frog? Yeah, absolutely. So what's going to happen? Uh, the males will begin to call in the breeding season, which typically in Australia falls within the summer months. Um, we do have some winter breeding frogs, but for the most part, frogs are breeding uh, when it warms up. The males will begin to call, um, the females will come in, and then they'll mate and they'll uh, produce a foam nest, um, and that's what has the eggs inside. They then uh, will basically go through the process of hatching and turning into tadpoles, which will spend most of their time uh, in the water. They've got a tail, they can swim around quite easily, um, but they're typically living in uh, fairly shallow, slow-moving water for the most part. And some species, this cane toad is a perfect example, um, can breed with minimal water available. If there's a small puddle on the side of a road, um, a cane toad can mate and breed and uh, lay their eggs in there. So that's a big part of the reason why they are so successful. So they'll lay the eggs, those tadpoles, um, they're spending time in the water, and then eventually those tadpoles will uh, develop legs and they'll reabsorb their tail. That's when they're starting to live both on land and in the water and essentially they're an adult frog or what we call a metamorph and then uh, they grow up and uh, they'll be breeding themselves one day and the process just goes on and on. Are frogs and toads the only kinds of amphibians? No, no. So there's several different uh, types of amphibians or groups. Um, frogs and toads are probably the, the most iconic and well-known of those. Um, but overseas, particularly in the Americas, we have uh, salamanders, we have Sicilians, which are a very long, thin, snake-like amphibian. They're very odd-looking, and also newts. Um, so there's a, a few different groups. But as I mentioned at the start, here in Australia, we only have frogs. So that's our only group. 
and we have over 200 species of native frog and one introduced toad, this guy. So cane toads, they can get quite big. Um, are they on the bigger end of to toads and frogs in the world? Yes, yeah, certainly. So there is a few frog species and a few other toads that would get to a similar size. Uh, another classic example is your large African bullfrog, which can get to about the size of a dinner plate, which is about as large as a female cane toad is going to get. So they are certainly on the larger side um, of all your frogs and toads, but there are some extremely large frogs out there as well. What about on the other end of the spectrum? What about tiny frogs? So what, what are we talking about and how small can they get? There's a lot of them and uh, they can be incredibly tiny. For example, here in Australia, we have um, a whole family of frogs, which uh, really doesn't get much longer than about two centimetres, three centimetres in length. So there is a lot of small ground dwelling frogs that um, pretty well go unnoticed. Not many people know about them. Um, they're typically not the ones that you're seeing out and about calling at your backyard pond. Um, they're the ones that go unnoticed and there is a lot of them. Some examples of very small Australian frogs would be uh, the corroboree frog that I mentioned before and the same genus, um, the red crowned toadlet, which is found within the Sydney region. So what kind of habitats um, do frogs live in and is it only just waterways or can they be found in other kinds of habitats? Yeah, so they're like most uh, groups of, of animals, they've adapted to basically live in a wide variety of habitats. Um, frogs, because they are for the most part relying on water to breed, um, they'll either require a permanent water source in the case of many of our Sydney species, um, but a lot of your desert species um, like your spadefoots um, and a few of your, your other frogs like your crucifix frogs, um, they can breed when rainfall occurs. So once rainfall happens, um, you get puddles and water forming on the ground and then they will utilize that to breed. But they can live in, in environments that can go long periods without rainfall and they simply just head underground and uh, bunker down. Now there's other species that live in the Kimberley, like our splendid tree frogs and Weigel's toadlet, um, which live in a fairly dry area um, that only gets rainfall for a certain period of the year. So um, they are a little bit variable. Some are more heavily reliant on water than others, um, but they do occur across a wide variety of habitats. One last question. At the Australian Reptile Park, one of the most popular things we're asked is for animal identifications. Yes. And we're often sent pictures of common native frogs saying, is this a cane toad? Do you want to maybe go through those species and maybe what people can look for at home that might make them a little bit different to identifying a cane toad? Yeah, absolutely. So um, depending on where you are is really going to depend on whether you could potentially come across a cane toad or not. So if you live uh, in the northern coastal regions of New South Wales from about Grafton, Coffs Harbour, anywhere north and then uh, right throughout the top end in the Northern Territory and down into WA, you are certainly likely at some stage to come across a cane toad. And you can see what they look like. As I mentioned, they have these big poison glands behind the eye, and then they have this rough, warty looking skin. They look quite different to a lot of other uh, of frog species. Where it gets a bit tricky is when they're young. When they're young, they're typically a little lighter in color. Sometimes they can have some yellow and some light brown on them. And uh, they can look a little bit similar to our native uh, frog species. So um, what you basically want to be looking for is the texture, the texture of the skin. If you can see that it's got this uh, bumpy, warty skin, then more likely than not, it is a, uh, a small cane toad. All right, now I'm gonna pop this guy back in there because he's getting a little bit uh, agitated there. He's, I thought he was gonna uh, croak there for a second, but he's been pretty silent. Um, we uh, are gonna wrap it up there, guys. I hope you enjoyed that and learnt a little bit about uh, just these three species we've seen here and about amphibians as a whole. Um, we are gonna keep bringing you these uh, daily live streams, so stay tuned. I'll see you tomorrow and uh, hope to uh, see you then. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.